And you knew it was coming, man. It's Halloween, man. It's Halloween. Oh. Anyway, welcome to church, everybody. My name is Jeremy. This is Carla. This is Jeremy. This is Carla. This is the band. And man, we are ready to lead you in some songs of praise. So ready to lead you in some songs of praise. So I want to invite you to stand on up and let's do it. Let's sing up and let's do it. Let's sing some songs of praise to a God who is good, to a God who loves each and God who is good to a God who loves each and every one of us. Here we go.
Well, I love in moments of worship, we get to step into the presence of God. And we don't have to check anything at the door. We don't have to leave it there. We worship a God who says, bring it all to me. We can bring our fears. We can bring our failures, our doubts, our insecurities. We can bring our broken relationships. We can bring our addictions, our struggles. He says, bring it all to me. In John 16, it says, in this world, you have trouble. You will have trouble. But Jesus reminds us that to take heart, for I have overcome the world. Jesus reminds us in this moment that we can come to him with everything because he's overcome it already. And I love the reminder of this next song that we're gonna sing because I I don't know what you're going through right now. I don't know what you're feeling or what you're facing in, in life right now, but this song forever reminds us that it's in Jesus that we find breakthrough. It's in Jesus that we're able to experience joy and peace regardless of our circumstances. And it's in Jesus that we are able to overcome absolutely anything that comes our way because through his sacrifice, through losing his life, we're able to experience freedom in everything that we face. And so this is not a a moment right now kind of thing that we get to experience his love his forgiveness, his grace, it's a forever kind of love that we get to experience. And so as we sing this next song, let's allow the Holy Spirit to remind us that it's because of Jesus and his overcoming of everything that we might face that we get to experience that love, that grace and forgiveness every single day forever and ever. So let's sing that together.
Thank you. Thank you for what you did on that cross for us, for each one of us. However, we came in here today, Jesus. God, sometimes we feel so broken, and the only person who can repair us is you, Jesus. So, God, we come in here today and we lay our things down before you, Jesus. You are able, you are willing, you are strong enough, God. So would you help us to let go of those things that we just can't do on our own, God? We need you. We need your strength. God, we worship you in this place. We pray all this in your powerful name. Amen. Hey, thanks for singing with us, everyone. Go ahead and take a seat. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Eagle Brook Online. No matter who you are or where you're watching from, we're glad that you're here. My name is Jeff. I'm the online campus pastor, and I have been for the last six months. And before taking this role, I was the campus pastor at our Anoka location. And when I was asked to consider this online gig, I really didn't know what I was saying yes to. I knew we had this large and growing online audience, but I wasn't sure how you make that feel like a community that's growing closer to God. But then I had this thought. I thought about Paul in the early church. Paul was a leader and church planner who started and supported many early church communities. He would go and visit some of these communities in person, but the majority of his communication was done by writing letters. And at that time, writing letters was difficult and very expensive way to communicate. But it allowed him to encourage and instruct these early churches in what it meant to be followers of Jesus. Paul's letters would eventually make up the majority of the New Testament that we have in our Bible today. And Paul was leveraging the technology of his day to reach as many people for Christ as he possibly could. And in that same way, that's why we do online church. We're leveraging the technology of our day to reach as many people for Christ as we possibly can. I mean, think about it. Right now, we're reaching thousands of people who are watching in their living rooms, people sitting behind their computers or watching on their cell phones all around the world. And maybe you'd say, yeah, I'm watching a service, but am I really a part of a church community? And if you feel like that, one of the easiest ways for you to get plugged in is to join us for our upcoming mid-sized group, Five Values to Live By. We're meeting over Zoom for a little over an hour and for five weeks in a row, starting Monday, November 15th. 
We talked about this group a couple of weeks ago and had a great response. There's still room to join, but in order to support the amount of people that have signed up, we could really use some more discussion group leaders. All you need to do is be willing to facilitate a discussion with the questions that we've already prepared for you. Now, if you want to join the group or are interested in being a discussion leader, simply text the word groups to 77888. Or you can always email us at online at eaglebrookchurch.com. With that, Jason has the message for us as we close out our series, Ghost Stories. Before we get there, check this out. come upon you, you will receive power and will tell people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. All right, well, next weekend is going to be an exciting weekend in the life of our church. We're going to be talking about where God is leading us in the future. And if you're someone who is an owner at this church, I want to ask you to be here. It's going to be a can't-miss kind of weekend. And if you're a person who goes, you know what, I'd like to step into more ownership. I've always said, I don't want to stand on the sidelines and watch what God is doing. I want to participate. I want to be a part of it. And you're going to have an opportunity to do that next weekend. We've also got some exciting news to share with you as well. So that's next weekend. Uh, This weekend is Halloween weekend. And what better topic to talk about than ghost stories? But the difference in this series is that the stories we're talking about are real. They're true. We're not talking about ghosts and goblins. We're talking about angels, demons, demons. And spirits. In fact, the story that we're going to look at from the Bible today, this is my personal opinion, I think it's the craziest story in the Bible. I mean, I remember reading through this and I'm like, is this for real? This is like nothing else I've ever read in Scripture. But when you get past some of the crazy stuff, what you see is a man named Saul who's stuck. He's completely panicked. He's living in fear. He's living in anxiety. He's feeling the stress and the pressure. And so he tries to control the situation on his own. And maybe you've been there before. Maybe you're there right now where there's a part of your life where you're going, I'm stuck. Financially, relationally, maybe there's a sin in your life that you can't seem to get rid of. There's a decision that you have to make and you're looking around and you're going, I don't know what to do. I feel completely out of control. I feel completely hopeless. I am stuck. A few years ago, I was pulling into my neighborhood, and there's a pond across the street from our old house, and I saw a bunch of teenagers gathered around this pond, which I didn't think much of because they had been driving four-wheelers through there a lot. But as I pulled around the pond to go up my driveway, I saw the reflection of something down in the pond. I looked, and it was a full-size pickup truck. Apparently, what had happened is these kids were driving four-wheelers through the pond, and they thought, oh, if you can drive a four-wheeler through the pond, let's try to drive Daddy's pickup truck through the pond. I backed up. I pulled up to this group of teenagers. I said, whose truck is that? This 16-year-old, who was clearly shaken up about the whole thing, he said, it's my truck. And then these were his exact words. He goes, it was so stupid. We're so stupid. I'm so stupid. We're just stupid kids, sir. (laughs) Now, I wondered if it was time to remind him about David Walsh's research that a man's brain is not fully formed until they're 25 years old. (laughs) Because clearly this had seemed like a great idea to them at the time. But in retrospect, that's because they had half a brain. My oldest son, who was five years old, he came running out of the house to meet me. He stood next to my car. He looked at me and he goes, I'm sick of these kids driving their four-wheelers around the neighborhood. 
So we moved out here for some peace and quiet. I'm like, geez, the kid's a parrot. Like you just say something and he repeats it to everybody else. But this 16 year old looked at me and he said, hey, can you tow my truck out of the pond? Now I know I look like a pretty manly guy to you. But I'm looking at this truck, it's 20 feet down the incline, there's mud over the tires, and I'm not even sure I have a rope. Like, I don't even know if I have a rope in my garage. I said, there is no way I'm going to be able to tow you out. You are going to have to call a tow truck. And the moment I said tow truck, his eyes got real big. He said, oh, I don't want to do that. He said, if that happens, my dad's going to find out, and my dad's going to kill me. We did end up having to call a tow truck. And I never saw that kid again. I really didn't, but I don't think anything happened. But here's my point. All of us at times in life get stuck. It seemed like a good idea at the time, but then when we look back on it, we go, wait a minute, what was I thinking? And now we feel completely stuck. You purchased a house. You thought it was going to be a great investment, but now you're up to your waist in debt. You're on the brink of foreclosure. One of your kids has been struggling with something and you've done everything you can to help them. You've tried everything that you can think of and nothing has worked and you're looking around and you're going, I, I don't know what to do. We're just, we're just stuck. Maybe there's a reoccurring sin in your life that you're trying to break or a decision that you have to make or a relationship that just feels stuck to you. But let me ask you, where in your life right now do you look at it and go, I, I don't know what to do. I am stuck. As I was thinking about this feeling that we all experience from time to time, I realized that there's really four stages that we go through. And the first stage that we go through is we need to make a decision. So there's a decision in your life. There's a problem in your life. There's something that you're trying to figure out. And the second stage is there's a lack of direction. Now, this is obvious. If you had direction, you wouldn't feel stuck. But since you don't have direction, you're going, I don't really know what to do here. And this leads to the third stage. And this is where it starts to get to our heart. This is where it starts to get emotional. It's a feeling of desperation. You're laying awake at night and you're looking up at the ceiling and you're just going, God, help me. You feel stressed. You feel anxious. You feel overwhelmed. You have this feeling of desperation of, I, I don't know what to do about this. And that leads to the fourth stage. And the fourth stage is a desire to control the situation. And this is where it starts to get really dangerous. Because we start to think, well, I, I have to control this. I have to manipulate this. I have to make sure that I can get this the way I want it to go. There's a man named Saul who went through all four of those stages. It started when the prophet Samuel died. The prophet Samuel was always Saul's go-to when it came to knowing what God wanted him to do. And that was a good thing. Samuel was a godly prophet. He was sent by God to help Saul navigate being a king. But here was the problem. Saul didn't always listen to Samuel's advice, which by extension meant that he wasn't always listening to God's advice. So God would say to Saul through the prophet Samuel, he'd say, you're going to win this battle. And when you win the battle, I don't want you to take any plunder for yourself. And Saul would kind of obey. He would win the battle. He wouldn't take much plunder, but he'd just take a little bit, just a few little treasures here and there. And this was Saul's MO through his life. He would obey mostly, but not fully. And so after years of this, the prophet Samuel looked at Saul and he said, you're going to lose your kingship. The crown is going to be taken off your head and it's going to get given to a man named David. 15 years after that pronouncement, 15 years after the prophet Samuel had died, the Philistine army had assembled on a hill and they were a huge army. They had surrounded Saul and the Israelites and Saul didn't know what to do. And so here's what he did, starting in verse 5. It said, when Saul saw the Philistine army, he was afraid. Terror filled his heart. He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him. 
Now, if we didn't know any context of this verse, this should bother us. I mean, here's a guy who wants to know what God wants him to do. He's coming before God and going, God, I need your help. I need your wisdom. And God's like, not giving it to you. N not going to answer your prayer. I mean, this just seems so strange. Don't you think God would be thrilled that someone would be asking him for advice and for wisdom? I mean, you think about all the millions of billions of people who just ignore God, and here's one guy going, God, tell me what to do, and God's going, I'm not answering your prayer. But there's some context here that's important. Saul had just ordered all the priests in Israel killed. The priest was an intermediary between the people and between God. If you wanted to know what God wanted you to do, you could go to the priest, and they would kind of intercede for you. You can't do that, Saul, because you killed all the priests. And then, as I mentioned, Saul wouldn't always fully obey God. He might obey God a little, but not fully. And so after years of this, finally God said, you know what? I, I'm not going to answer your prayer. I'm not going to speak to you about this. Quick question. Do you think that could happen to us today? Do you think it would be possible for a person to ignore God for so long? And disobey God so many times that at some point in their life, they call out to God and there's just radio silence. I think that is possible. But here's the really good news. And this is good news for every single one of us here today. We are one act of repentance away. We are one moment of saying, God, I messed up. I screwed up. Would you forgive me? And the communication lines would open back up again. Saul never did that. He never repented for what he did. Instead, he turned to his personal assistant. He said, find me a woman who's a medium so that I may inquire of her. His assistant said, there's one in Endor that you could go see. A medium is someone who communicates with the dead. And this was a strange request for Saul to make because in addition to killing all the priests... Saul had kicked all the mediums and spiritists out of Israel. Which this is where like Saul had some good sides and some bad sides. Because while it was wrong and disobedient to kill the priests, he was obeying God when he kicked the mediums and spiritists out of Israel. He even decreed that anyone who went to see a medium would be put to death. Now you might be saying, well, how does this apply to our lives today? It applies a lot. Today we have horoscopes. We have mediums. We have witches. We have tarot cards. We have palm readers, astrology, Ouija boards. I've talked to followers of Christ before who had no idea that God had commanded his followers to have nothing to do with those things. And they were shocked to hear that God wouldn't want them to consult something like that. And here's why God doesn't want us to consult something like that. Because each of them sets itself up as God. Each of them says, oh, if you, if you have this decision, you want to know the future, don't consult God about that. Consult your horoscope. Don't consult God about that. Consult a medium. Have your palm read. Each of them sets themselves up as God, which is the essence of idolatry. So here's Saul, and he says, is there a medium that I can go see? And his assistant said, well, there's one in Endor. And so Saul disguises himself. Just think about this. He's the leader of the nation. He's the leader of the army. And now he's dressed up like an old woman in a cloak, sneaking past his own army. He gets to the front door of this medium in Endor, and he knocks. She answers the door, and here's what she says. She says, surely you know what Saul decreed. She doesn't recognize Saul. He's in a disguise. He, he doesn't, she doesn't know who he is. She says, are you trying to get me killed? Right away, she's like, government sting. <laughs> Undercover cops, not my normal clientele, not my normal hours. I mean, she's sniffing this out. She doesn't know who Saul is. But Saul looks at her and he says, as surely as the Lord lives, you won't be punished for this. Now, here's a side note. If your brother, and it's probably going to be your brother, your brother, your sister, or a friend ever says to you, just do it. You won't get caught. Don't do it. 
Okay, whatever they're telling you to do, do not do it. For some reason, this medium, even though she doesn't know who Saul is, she believes him. And so she says, who do you want me to call up from the dead? And he said, I want you to call up the prophet Samuel. Next verse. When the woman, when the medium, saw Samuel, she cried out at the top of her voice. Another translation says she was afraid. She was in terror. And she said to Saul, why have you deceived me? You are Saul. Now, I don't know why, but for some reason, when she sees Samuel coming up from the dead, her eyes are open and she realizes who's asking her for this. It's the king. So Saul replies to her. He, she says, do not be afraid. What do you see? The woman said, I see a ghostly figure coming up out of the earth. Now, this is the point in the story where if we were around a campfire, we'd all be going, ooh. Because it's kind of spooky. But notice that Saul doesn't see what she sees. She can see it, but he can't. And so he says to her, he says, what does he look like? And she said, well, it's an old man wearing a robe is coming up. If I was Samuel, I'd be a little insulted by that. Like, I've been dead for 15 years. Who are you calling old? Okay, like maybe I've aged a little bit. And then she says he's an old man wearing a robe, which I'm like, well, that could be anybody. But in Samuel 15, when Samuel was still alive, at one point he was wearing a robe and Saul reached out to grab him and he ripped part of his robe. And I wonder if it was the same robe, because when she says this, right away, Saul goes, oh, yeah, it's Samuel. And this is when Samuel speaks in verse 15. He says, Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Now, at this point, I, I don't know about you. I have all kinds of questions. Because I've seen mediums on TV, and they claim to communicate with the dead. And I'm always like, oh, that's crazy. And so then I ask, is that possible? And then I'm wondering, is this really Samuel? Did Samuel really appear and speak to Saul? Few observations for you. The first one is, the plain reading of the text is that it is Samuel, and that he is speaking to Saul. But my second observation is that the medium was in terror. She was surprised when she saw Samuel come up out of the earth. Which indicates to me that maybe this had never happened before. Maybe she had tried to communicate from the dead, but it never actually happened. She was kind of manipulating the whole thing. But now when she saw the real deal, she was in shock. She was in terror. And so maybe this doesn't happen, but God allowed it to happen in this instance to teach Saul a lesson. Whatever the case, Saul responds to Samuel's question. He says, well, the Philistines are fighting against me and God has departed from me. He no longer answers me, so I've called on you to tell me what to do. Just think about his logic here. I want to know what God wants me to do. God's not telling me what to do. So I'm going to do something that God has said never do, so then maybe God will tell me what to do. I mean, I would like to pile judgment on him here, but don't we do something similar? I mean, there's times when I've told a lie and I've thought, okay, well, I'll just tell another lie. And then maybe I'll tell another lie to try to cover up for that lie. Or aren't there times in life where we're living in unrepentant sin? I mean, there's something that we're doing that we're just like, oh, yeah, I mean, maybe God has said something about that. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do whatever I want. I'm going to sleep with whoever I want. I'm going to live with whoever I want. I'm going to just do whatever I want. And then over here, we're like, well, God, bless me. Give, give me your wisdom, God. That's what Saul is doing here. And so Samuel looks at Saul and he says this, tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. It's a chilling statement. What he means is tomorrow you and your sons will no longer be in the land of the living. You will be in the land of the dead. And his prediction proves true. The next day, the Philistine army attacks. Saul's three sons are killed. Saul is surrounded by the army. And when he sees what's about to happen, he doesn't want to be captured alive. And so he says to his armor bearer, run your sword through me. 
And the armor bearer is like, I- I'm not doing that. And so Saul puts his sword on the ground. He falls on it and takes his own life. And then the armor bearer takes his own life. And it was a sad ending to what for King Saul started as a promising life. Here's the question I want to ask today. What do you do when you don't know what to do? What do you do when you go, I'm stuck and I just don't know what to do right now. I feel powerless. I feel out of control. I don't know what to do. Here's the first truth that I want you to remember in that situation. And it's this. When you feel powerless, tap into the power of God. See, Saul was looking for some spiritual power. He was looking for it in a medium. He was looking for some pseudo-spiritual power. And all the while, the power that he needed, the power that he wanted, was in the Spirit of God. Romans chapter 8 says this. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, then the same spirit, the same power that rose Christ from the dead, it lives in you. I've told this story before, but several years ago, I was speaking at a church out in California, and I was talking about being discontent. And so I shared a story one time when I was discontent with a birthday present that my family had gotten me. They got me some tennis shoes, and I wanted Raphael Nadal tennis shoes instead. And so I kind of confessed my pettiness and how I was wrong about this. Well, after the sermon, a guy came up to me and he said, when's your birthday? Which kind of creeped me out because that story was in the middle of the message and this was the end of the message. And so I'm like, what are you talking about? But I just told him, I said, well, November 5th, he said, what size shoe do you wear? And then it clicked for me. I said, well, I'm going to size 11, but you don't have to buy me shoes but, but I'm a size 11. Um. <laughs> and so I, I didn't think anything of it. A few months later, I got a, an email and it said, Jason, thank you so much for coming out to speak at our church. Thank, well, I want to thank you. I loved your Raphael and the doll story. And to thank you and bless you, pick which color you want of the Nike Lunar Ballistic model of tennis shoes. And I'm embarrassed to tell you how long it took me to pick a color. I mean, I was going to all my friends who have fashion sense And I was like, which color would you choose? Which color would you choose? I just went back and forth. But here was the funny thing. I never wore the shoes. If it was muddy out, not wearing them. If it was raining or snowy out, not going to wear them. If I was going to be outside, I would not wear them. In the first year that I owned the shoes, I wore them two times. Otherwise, I would open up my closet. I would look at those shoes on the shelf and I would go, man, those are good looking shoes. But I never actually wore them. The Bible says that God has given us a gift. And just like the gift that this man in California gave to me, the gift has an intended purpose. The purpose of shoes is to be worn. The gift that God has given to us is the Holy Spirit. And there's a purpose to the Holy Spirit. Look at what it says in Acts 1.8. But when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will receive power. I want to ask you today, do you have that power? For far too many believers, the Holy Spirit is like a fancy pair of shoes that sit on the shelf. We like the idea of it. We're glad it's there. It looks good, but we don't use it. We don't put it on. We don't tap into its power. First Corinthians chapter four talks about this. It says, for the kingdom of God is not just fancy talk. It's living by God's power. It's not just knowing words like eschatology and pneumatology. Living in the kingdom of God is living by God's power. It's a power that will make you bold in your faith. It's a power to help you love people that you don't want to love and forgive people you don't feel like forgiving. It's a power to have joy and peace when life is painful. It's a power to live a supernatural life in a natural world. And the Bible says that if you're a follower of Christ, that power is available to you today. The same power that rose Christ from the dead, it lives in you. But you got to put your shoes on. 
One of my favorite verses in the Bible throughout my life has been 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And God is speaking at the beginning here, and he says, my grace is sufficient for you. I don't know who needed to hear that today, but God's grace is sufficient for you. He says, my power is made perfect in weakness. In other words, when you're feeling weak, that's when God's power is going to be the strongest in your life. And so Paul adds on, he says, therefore, I'll boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. I was talking to my wife about this and she said, you know, some of my favorite messages that you or others give are when you give us a prayer to pray that week. And I love that. And so I just want to give you a really simple prayer that you can pray with me this week. And here's the prayer. Holy Spirit, fill me with your power. When you have a meeting coming up that you're nervous about and you've got a hard conversation that you have to have with another person, you pray, Holy Spirit, fill me with your power right now. When there's a relationship in your life, maybe it's your parents, maybe it's one of your kids, and it's just struggling, and you're stuck, and you don't know what to do, pray this prayer, Holy Spirit, fill me with your power. When you're weak, and you feel like anxiety is overwhelming you, and you're overwhelmed by the stresses of life, Holy Spirit, fill me with your power. Your grace is sufficient for me right now. Your power will be made perfect in weakness. When we're powerless, that's the time to tap into the power of God. Here's the second truth that I hope you remember when you don't know what to do. And the truth is this. When you feel out of control, trust the one who's in control. You know, I just want to go back to Saul for a moment. Saul was out of control. He felt out of control. This army was surrounding him. They were too big. They were too great. There was no way they were going to win. And he was feeling this sense of panic and stress and anxiety, and he was out of control. And don't we feel that way from time to time? I mean, aren't there times in our life where we go, the prognosis is too grim. The marriage is too far gone. Uh, This sin, I've been struggling with it for years. Your boss or your coach or your teacher made a decision that affected you and it was out of your control. There's nothing you could do about it. And so when you feel out of control, I want to remind us today to trust in the one who is in control. You know, right now I'm I'm in control. I've got this microphone around my head, and so I can say whatever I want, and there's really nothing anyone can do about it. And that's how some people are with God. They they go through life, and they go, I can't see God, so therefore I must be in control. I can say whatever I want, I can do whatever I want, and you, and all of you, you can't tell me what to do, because I'm in control. But here's the reality. Right now at our Lionel Lakes campus, back at the sound booth, there's a guy named Trent, And Trent's in control. (laughs) I might think I'm in control. I might think, you know, I can say whatever I want. I can do whatever I want. I'm in control. But (laughs) see, I think I'm in control, but I'm not in control. There's one that you can't see who's ultimately in control. Everything we see with our eyes is controlled by a hand that we cannot see. He's the one who keeps the earth spinning. He's the one that keeps our lungs breathing. Everything we see is controlled by one that we cannot see. And so here's a second prayer for you this week. And it's a really simple prayer. Lord, help me. Lord, I I don't know what to do. I've got this decision that I'm trying to make, and I go back and forth, and I've written out pros and cons, and I don't know what to do. Lord, help me. Lord, my parents are separating, and this is really affecting me. Lord, I need you to help me. 
God, I've got this situation at work, and I don't know what to do. I, I, I don't know. My integrity's on the line. I'm being criticized. Lord, help me. There's a bully at school, and I'm going to see him again tomorrow. Lord, help me. Where in your life do you need to pray this very simple prayer? Lord, would you help me? One of my spiritual heroes is a man named Tim Keller. Keller is a pastor and an author. I've read several of his books. And recently he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, which is a really serious form of cancer and a hard cancer to treat. And I recently saw a webinar where he was speaking to pastors and he was asked about the fact that he has cancer and how he's dealing with that. And he talked about the difference between relative hope and infallible hope. Relative hope, he says, is something that we all have as human beings living here on earth. Relative hope is, well, I live in New York and I've got some of the best doctors in the world. And I've got access to great health care and there's medicine and there's chemotherapy and it's looking good and the doctor says it's moving in the right direction. And so I have this relative hope that I'm going to be healed of my cancer. But the difference between a believer and a non-believer is a, a non-believer has relative hope. A believer has relative hope and infallible hope. And infallible hope is different. Infallible hope is deeper. So I want you to watch Tim Keller as he talks about infallible hope. Take a look. So in um, May of uh, this year, I was diagnosed with uh, pancreatic cancer. And as you all know, that's a, uh, a particularly difficult kind of cancer to treat. When I talk about hope uh, for myself, since I now have pancreatic cancer, there's a relative hope and then there is a, um, there's an infallible hope. Relative means that things may go well, things may not go well. But you see, as Christians, we also have an infallible hope. In the Bible, when you see the word hope in the New Testament, it's talking about confidence. When it says we have a hope in the resurrection, it means we have an absolutely, we have absolute confidence in it. And so the two things that Kathy and I have, the infallible hope we have, um, that is far stronger than the, the relative hope, is that we, we have confidence in the goodness of God's will. God knows how long I should live. And if I tried, uh, and his will is good and perfect, you know, Romans 12. And if I would even try to change that will by a day, it wouldn't be as good. So I've got hope in his will. And secondly, I have absolute confidence in the resurrection. And so, um, you see, Kathy and I are able to say, we've got this great relative hope in the medicine. It really might turn out well. But, you know, in any case, we've got this absolutely infallible hope. His will is so good that he's got a million, a billion, a hundred billion good reasons why I have gotten cancer at this stage of my life. And uh, I can rest in that. <laughs> it's absolute, I absolute confidence. And so whatever you're facing right now because of COVID and the virus, uh, you might be actually facing a lot of difficulty and a lot of uh, difficulty and uh, uncertainty. But you also have relative hope, but you've also got the infallible hope. The absolute certainty that God's will is good and he has a hundred billion good reasons why what's happening is happening. And the knowledge that eventually we're all going to be together. We're all going to be standing before his throne, casting our crowns before him, lost in wonder, love, and praise. Now, of course, God doesn't want us to have cancer, and God doesn't cause cancer. God's not the author of evil and disease. But we have this infallible hope. And the infallible hope is that God works all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. We have this infallible hope that God's grace is sufficient for us, that his power is made perfect in weakness. We have this infallible hope that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and we have the hope, the promise of eternal life, that one day we can look back on our life here on earth and it will all make sense to us, and we will realize that God was in control. What I noticed watching that video wasn't just what Tim Keller said, it was how he said it. It was his demeanor. He was calm, he was at peace. 
even though he has cancer raging through his cells in his body. It's the exact opposite of Saul. Saul was panicked. Saul was living in fear and anxiety. And I want to ask you today, which one are you going to be? Don't panic. Don't let fear and stress and anxiety and tear take over your mind or your heart. Declare with me today that his grace is sufficient. Declare with me today that God is in control and that he is good and he cares about you and he loves you. We have this infallible hope. So when you feel powerless, tap into the power of God. When you feel out of control, trust in the one who's in control. Let's pray together as we close. God, there are some of us here today who don't know what to do. There's a decision, there's a situation in our life, and we are stuck, and we do not know what to do right now. God, I pray right now that we would not try to control the situation in our own human power and wisdom, that we would not try to manipulate the situation. But God, give us the ability to trust you. Give us a peace knowing that we can trust you. Knowing that you are good, knowing that you are all powerful, knowing that you care about us, knowing that your grace is sufficient, knowing that you work all things for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purposes. Holy Spirit, fill us with your power. Lord, help us. Where we're weak right now, I pray for your strength to fill us, to fill our spirit and to fill our soul. God, I thank you that we're one act of repentance away, that when we acknowledge our sin and we turn towards you, the communication lines open back up and that we can approach you with confidence, that we can approach you with hope, knowing that you care about us. God, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, at every one of our campuses down front, we've got a group of people who would love to pray for you. And so come on down front for prayer if you'd like to. Otherwise, have a great weekend, everybody.